as you pay attention to listen. God bless you. For our scripture reading, we're taking it from Genesis chapter 2, verses 24. Reading from Genesis chapter 2, verses 24. I'm reading from the Amplified Version. It says, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Let me take it again. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Amen. We're going to have our theme song, which is from SDH 579. It is love that makes us happy. Hymn 579. That makes us happy, it is love that smooths the way, it helps us mind, it makes us kind to others every day. God is love with his little children. God is love, we would be like him. It is love that makes us happy, it is love that smooths the way. It helps us mind, it makes us kind to others every day. This world is full of sorrow, of sickness, death, and sin. With love and hearts, we'll do our part and try some soul to win. Go. Mind. It makes us kind to others every day. And when this life is over and we are called apart, our song shall be eternally of Jesus and His love. God is love. We And those of you watching around the world, it is a pleasure to be with you and to be with you throughout the entire week where we have the opportunity to glean from scriptures and to know the things God has purposed for us to be able to start it well into the greatest institution I have ever come to know and to rebuild families as well. And so this evening, it's a joy to be with you. 
And I just want to say that with all our social media platform, Prince Emmanuel Seventh Day Adventist Church, you will be able to join in with your comments and your questions as well. The flyers, as has been displayed for you, you also have the opportunity to join in on the Zoom platform. The details are clearly spelled out there. And you would be glad that you were part of this program because the Lord has good things for you. The Lord has purpose in his heart. And he has said in Jeremiah 29 verse 11 that I know the thoughts that I think towards you. They are thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. That included your future marriage. God is just about to unleash into your life that ideal man, that ideal woman. God is just about lubricating and reviving your, your marriage again. And that is why I don't want you to miss out in any of the series that we have to share this week. And so, I respectfully and kindly ask you that wherever you are, you will bow for some few minutes as we seek the Lord's face in prayer. Father, we love you because you have first loved us. We thank you for your tender mercies and we thank you for your loving kindness. You are such a great and awesome God and there is none like you. We thank you that we can serve you and worship you both in spirit and in truth. This evening, you have purpose and granted that, Father, I will lead out in this whole week exercise. Please, in the name of Jesus, let me not speak from my intellect and my wisdom because they will not be beneficial. Let me speak thus saith the Lord. I pray in the name of Jesus that you, O Lord, will touch my lips and that they will move under the impulses of your love. I pray that I will speak with clarity and with understanding to, to everyone that is part of this program all around the world and in this auditorium. Be with us, for we have prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. And so you're welcome once again. And this week happens to be the Christian home and marriage week and we have teamed this entire week long studies in the bible with regards to starting up marriage and how to build marriage and revive marriage on the team i will go with my family unity in community and so we are saying that we are not going if we are married we are not going Without our wives, we are not going without our children. We will go as a family. And those of us who are yet to enter into this institution, it is the same that if God granted that you would start a family life before he comes, you will have the opportunity to enter the heavenly kingdom one day with your entire family. And if it, it, it pleases the Lord that you will not be married by the time he has come, you will still make it because you would have recognized those things which are the details, the precepts, the principles, and the commandments of the living God. And so I am glad that you share in this. We are going together and we are building a community. And so yesterday, we began with a, with a week-long program where we shared on the topic in the morning marriage has been a gift from God. For me, if you ask me, and I want to retreat to what I said yesterday, that my only challenge and my only difficulty with God, if I am permitted to say that, is to always leave. I mean, get up in the morning with the realization that one day when we go to heaven, there will not be marriage. That has been my difficulty was how I wish that God would allow it and grant it that when we get to heaven, I will still be married to my beautiful wife, Eva. But unfortunately, God knows best. And he's wise. And he's so, so wise to make mistakes. And so, I, 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 for God and what he has done with regards to marriage and everything, I don't see any level, the minutest level of, of deficiency in what God himself has planned for us. 
And so this week, expect more. As we, we are going to satisfy by the grace of God every individual who, who would, would be put in any kind of category. You will be satisfied that you were part of this program. And so we'll be speaking specifics. We'll be, we'll be dealing with issues with those who are contemplating on marriage. We'll be dealing with issues with those who are not even yet praying on the issue of marriage, which I encourage you to do because it is something one day you would want to enter. And then we'll be talking to those of us who are already in it and are having hard times. And those of us, probably by the grace of God, who are having good times. How I, I am waiting earnestly to share those bits and pieces with you, my friend. But for tonight, what we have to discuss is what every person needs to know before getting married. What every person needs to know before getting married. I have had the opportunity to speak with all all manner of people, singles, contemplating, um, 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 guys, and uh, I mean around around the world, and and, and people who are already in married uh, in marriage, and 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 the struggles they are going through. Just yesterday, I had the opportunity to speak to a group of young people somewhere around Adenta at Peniel Church, and the questions that came and the contributions that came. You you get to realize that we live in a world. When it comes to this particular issue and this institution, there is some high level of confusion that we need God to settle us in. And that is why we want to take time and dissect and go deep into some of these things and from the Bible's perspective. And so this week I will be speaking to you as a pastor and a pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I will be speaking to you as a counselor. I read the Bible with the eye of a counselor. I read the Bible with the eye of a pastor. And I see God's intention for us being pure and crystal clear. Friends, the institution of marriage is as old as the creation of this world. And if you read Genesis chapter 2, verses 24, we'll get to know a principle that is happening in our world today where it gets to a point a man will leave his family and will be joined to another who has left his family and the two shall become one. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh i cannot overemphasize that point and i am glad that yesterday we were able to go through and when when i look at the fact that adam was made to go into a deep sleep and when he woke up to his amazement, there was this beautiful woman that stood before him and Adam could not hide his joy and happiness but to make that public declaration. This is the bone of my bones and this is the flesh of my flesh. How I wish I was, I, I, I'm so much deep into linguistic and I'll be, I'll, I will sound like a poet who will be able to relieve those words even as I share and read them tonight. But it is as succinct as it is. God, Adam was making that public declaration. And if you look at the Hebrew rendition, uh, you look at the man being Aish and the woman being Isha, and Adam looking at the wife and saying that grammatical thing as a masculine feminine. And Adam was saying that Eve was one of his kind. He says, this is the bone of my bones and the flesh of my flesh. That is how the institution of married, marriage dates back into time. But my friends, it is an undeniable fact that the marriage, that marriage in the 21st century is faced with some numerous and daunting challenges that most times overwhelming the Christian marriage. I mean, and those, most times it's so overwhelming that even Christian marriages are no exemption. 
Every marriage is having their fair share of the struggles of this world. In fact, marriage is gradually losing its relevance and therefore has become an issue of concern to everyone in this noble institution. And if you ask me, I will say that if there was ever a time that a man and married couples might guard jealously against, or je I mean, guard jealously this, this holy institution, it is in this our world. And so, I am discussing with you on marriage from the Christian perspective. And that I must emphasize. What is Christian marriage? In fact, you see, even if you are watching at this time or listening at this time, I just want to impress upon your hearts that you may not even be a Christian. But if you would, if you would follow through and, and would, 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 would test this tested and, and tried principles that I will be sharing with you, as you will want to prepare to enter into that holy institution, it will still be relevant to you. Christian marriage is one in which husband and wife are individually faithful first to Christ and to his service and second to each other. I don't know how many times you may have read such, such a definition of, of, of marriage or of Christian marriage. But I believe with my whole heart this kind of definition because you see, anybody who would be a better husband, a better wife, are those individuals who have a, 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 an excellent relationship with Christ. If you don't have a relationship with Christ, it would be extremely difficult to be able to be faithful to your wife and be faithful to your husband. If you ask that marriage counselor and that prolific writer, H. Norman Wright, H. Norman Wright, in his, in his book, Marriage Counseling, written in 1995, page 11, you, he puts it so succinctly when he says that marriage is not an event, but a way of life. And I see him defining marriage almost like the definition for culture. But you see, I want to say here and submit to you tonight that Marriage has not originated from any culture. And marriage has not originated from any individual. Marriage has originated from God. And that point must be established. In fact, nowadays, if you spend your time perusing the internet, you would find no shortage of studies, statistics, facts, even on the issue of divorce. Just even before I share with you on those principles, I want to bring your mind to, to the fact that marriage is under siege and marriage is under attack. And I want to spend the few, this few minutes, you know, going through some statistics and some daunting challenges that marriages are going through. And then I will share with you finally with those principles. There seems to be a, stu a study looking into almost every possible factor that might affect marriages and lead to divorce. Everywhere on the internet and, and all the news portals, you get to find people talking about it. And the more people talk about it, goes to confirm that it really is an issue. These studies have yielded some extremely interesting and in some cases, downright shocking information about divorce in both the United States of America and the rest of the world. Today, why is it so? Why is divorce all over the place? Is that God's intention for marriage? See, my friend that is watching this evening, I just want to impress upon your heart and those of us in the auditorium, I just want to impress upon your heart that you see, God has created for us one of the best institutions. In fact, if you take the, away the issue of, of, of worship and worshiping him on the Sabbath, worshiping him in spirit and in truth, the next gift he has given to man that is so awesome and excellent is the institution of marriage. But why is marriage facing lots of 
and lots of challenges to the effect that a lot of marriages are breaking and hitting on the rock. If your marriage is, or if your marriage is hitting on the rock tonight, I just want to say and encourage you that there is hope for you, my brother. There is hope for you, my sister. Because this week, God is about to unleash that blessing in your marriage. But my point really is this, this evening. Marriage has become like those disposables we have today. We have disposable plates. We have disposable diapers. We have disposable syringes. We have disposable everything. I dare say now today in our world we have disposable marriages. Marriages are simply just not clicking. They are simply just not working. What is it? Yes, I understand you that our arch enemy Satan is at work. But God has given us the without what 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 the ability and the capability to be able to withstand the challenges and make our our marriages beautiful ones that will send us even to heaven one day i want to say that marriages still will take a lot of people to heaven yet marriages again will send many to hell because they may have gotten it wrong how often my friend do you know the statistics how often that divorce takes place in the United States of America. Listen, and it's very shocking. Every 13 seconds, there is one divorce in America. Every 13 seconds, ke, 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 13, some marriage gets broken in the land of the United States of America, which means that there are nine divorces in the time it takes for a couple to recite their wedding vows. <laughs> Just before somebody will, the, the pastor or the priest will stand and to administer the wedding vows, some marriage has broken already. Which means also that 1,385 divorces happen during the average wedding reception of five hours. So if we have every, every uh, reception to every marriage lasting for five hours, 1,385 of them, or marriages, gets dissolved. Researchers estimate that 41% of all first marriages end in and divorce. Is that God's intention for marriage? What is wrong? And Ghana is having its fair share or her fair share of this ordeal. In Ghana, once one research I, I happen to have, have chanced on, that, that, which was done in, in, in the year 2017, said that 4,000 marriages get dissolved every year here in Ghana. And they went further to attribute three most frequent factors as to why marriages in Ghana get broken. The first is high expectations. And you see, it's very much so. Because maybe one of these days when we have time to share on the issue of marital myth. Marital myth. If, if you go through some of those myths in, 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 in marital homes or in marriages, you get to understand this point. There are high expectations. And when they have entered into that holy institution and they are met with those things, I mean things short of those things they were thinking of, then they will want to back off. The next one here in Ghana was attributed to lies. That many people are lying. And you know the most striking thing today my wife was sharing with me on this topic when she mentions that now what is happening in, in our world, including Ghana here, is the fact that some lab technicians, we have 
very, very brilliant and, and honest and sincere and lab technicians with a lot of integrity out there. But equally, we have some of them who, who are changing lab results to suit those individuals so that they can go ahead with their marriages. And so when people have entered into that kind of institution and they begin to see that all of those things that were said were lies, then they want to back off. One that, 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 that was frequent in the research was poor communication. And it is something this week I will deal with. In, in effect, I'll be sharing with you one of the most recent papers I have written on marriage. That has to do with positive communication in marriage. I'll be sharing that with you. It is, it is not for any, any just reason that this is prevalent in some of the factors that are leading to divorce here in Ghana. Friends, I am sure and I am keenly waiting to read research in, at the end of the year 2021 because of, of how of how 2020, the year 2020 presented itself. I am just, I, I'm just reading a lot of articles on the struggles of some marriage couples during this, this pandemic time and especially during the times of the lockdown where people have realized that they are inefficient, there, there are a, level, a high level of adequacy when it comes to marital life. And so I am waiting for what the, 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 the results of those researches that are being, that are being carried out around the world. I am, just, I, am just, I am saying that it's going to be a time bomb. But you see, COVID-19 and the year 2020 may increase the figures. Because when, when we, in times when we have not been stretched out to the limit, we are not able to live up to expectations. How much more? When we have limited space to operate, and when we are hard up, pushed to the corner, what actually can we do? And so as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and varying states of lockdowns all over the United States and around the world, we may be in the largest single-year increase in divorce in the decades. We will keep track of them, and I, and I am just waiting to, to see them. Gary Chapman, one of the, one of the counselors that I, I have followed for many years, he is, he is vested with, 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 <laughs> with high level of experience when it comes to marriage and family counseling. He's done marriage and family counseling for over 35 years. And that is no mean achievement. But listen to what Gary Chapman has said. Gary Chapman says that he believes that divorce is the lack of preparation for marriage and the failure to learn the skills of working together as inmate teammates. So he speaks about two things. That why marriages are suffering is as a result of lack of proper preparation. And that is what that is the bit we are addressing this evening. And the next one has to do with the skills. And so within the week, we'll be learning some requisite skills that will lubricate and revive our marriages that are hitting hard on the rock. But tonight, like I said, we'll be dealing with, with that which has to do with the preparation. But you see, I, I cannot even launch into that without mentioning at least three or four of the purposes for which God brought marriage. Number one. God realized that it was not good for man to be alone. And when I say realize, I am using that carefully because, you see, God cannot make mistake. I have, I have, I have sat in marriage counseling where I have, I, have, I, have, I have taken 
there would be couples, you know, to test on some of, some of these things. But you see, marriage is God's provision for the long-term blessing of man wherein he will find his greatest happiness. And so that is one of the reasons why God said that he would put man and woman together, if you can. Or in other words, it will get to a point in time where a man will leave his father and will leave his mother and will be joined together as one people. Number two, the marriage relationship teaches us about the nature of God. I, I am in love with this, this one too. If you look at how God's intention for marriage, and if you look at how God purposed marriage to be, this is what Henry, uh, uh, Henry Matthew, or Matthew Henry has to say. Matthew Henry says that, not from his head to top him up. You see, when, when God caused Adam, to fall into a deep sleep. Of course, even that, even without that, God could have created the woman like he did with Adam. But God chose not to go on that tangent. And it is not for, it is not for any just reason. There must be a reason to that. And the reason is so clear. And Matthew Henry says that, see, God didn't, didn't create from, you know, from, didn't create woman. Probably to, to top up for, for the man. No, it is far from that. And he continues, he says that, nor out of his feet, so that man will now be trampling upon the woman. He continues by saying that, but out of his side, to be equal with him. That was how Adam saw Eve when he was um, awakened. Under his arms, under his arms, uh, to be protected by him, and near his heart, to be loved by him. And God brought her to man, not as a separate creation. And I agree with him. And so if you look at God taking the ribs of Adam here, and creating the woman, was closer to the heart of man. And that is why, it beats my imagination when married couples who want to think that they cannot love their wives, they cannot love their husbands anymore. No, it cannot be true. That will be coming from somewhere else. My friend, God's purpose for marriage again was a provision for the increase and propagation of mankind. And so the only time babies will have to be made and for the multiplication of the human race is, is, is happening within the parameters of marriage. Anything, any kind of, of making babies outside of marriage is not God's intention. And that we must get it right. The marriage covenant is the synergistic relationship that secures the safe and stable environment for children to grow up. Children growing up outside of, of marriage as God has purposed it to be. The children suffer. They don't, they don't, they don't get happiness. They don't get joy. They, they lack it. And if, if care is not taken, they carry it into their marriages as well. What every person needs to know before getting married. Quickly, number one. Number one is know how matured you are. I know there are a lot of, a lot of things on the internet, for example, when it comes to some of the considerations you will have to make before getting married. Or going into that institution. And some of them are funny to read. Uh, just when I was reading quite recently, I found 
one, one, one article that would even suggest that, can you imagine, suggests that when you are preparing to go into a marriage with somebody, you must have plenty of sex. That cannot be true. That statement for me is very deplorable and devastating. It must not be happening so. It must be the other way around. And, and I shared yesterday with some young people when I gave one young lady one of those tests I give to young people when they say, when they come to the office and they are like, Pastor, I now have three and I don't know who to choose. I always begin with how lucky you are, my friend. But somebody is simply struggling to even get one. But you have three. But your confusion is founded. And so we'll deal with it. And sometimes I will ask them to write for me at least 10, 10 qualities they want to see in their ideal man or woman. Qualities based on principles, but not on feelings. No, 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 no. Because feelings will die out, but principles will stand the test of time. And when I read, I was outside Ghana then, and, and I took time that night to read through what the, because the young woman couldn't even wait when I was saying that it's late. Can we do that tomorrow? He says, no, pastor, I want to do it now. I will send it to you in some few minutes. I said, okay. And this young lady writes them, and I read about the, the last three. I read that I want a man who is very good in bed. And I ask myself, how would you know, young woman? How is that going to be possible? So, for example, if the 20th person would be the one, who would be the one who is good in bed, according to your standard, then you would have slept with 20 men. Can you imagine that? And that's why I'm saying that I'm speaking about principles and not feelings. There are a lot of them being bundled on the, on the internet and, and, some, and some media and news portals everywhere. But you must be careful which ones you are reading. And I am coming to you from the Christian perspective. And I need to emphasize that. I will not water down those principles on any day. But you must know how matured you are. I am just going to share about six with you tonight. What does that mean? Let's read some scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 20. Just grab your Bibles and let's do a bit of reading here. 1 Corinthians. Yes, chapter 14, verse 20. Let me read that to you here in my friend. Brethren, do not be children in understanding. However, in malice be babies, but in understanding be mature. In understanding, you would have to be mature. And so, in, 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 in making steps... To go into this holy institution, you will have to understand the dynamics and the nitty gritties of this institution. Anything short of that, you would, I mean, it will not be inconsequential. There will be some, some cost to pay for that. You may not ever be able to stand anywhere and say that marriage is beautiful. In fact, every married couple must be able to stand at any time and say that marriage is a beautiful one. But not everybody is able to say it. In fact, I share with you today, you see a, 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 a stat some statistics a senior colleague shared with me. And I remember him speaking at that marriage, uh, marriage ceremony and he's saying that when you take marriages in our world today, 
uh, when you take 100 marriages, 50 of them are beyond repairs. 45 of them are just on the, on, the, on the verge of breaking. And when we talk about ideal marriages, we are talking about 5% of them. And I'm asking those of you who are watching and listening who are married, is your marriage part of that 5%? I don't know how God feels as he sits up high on his throne as I mention this statistic. But God will be sad. And God will not be happy. That is why this week we are taking you through some of these things so that you would, you would do it and do it right. So you see, in your understanding of marriage, in your understanding on making a step into that holy institution, you must act maturely. And that is one of the considerations you must... So you do an introspect of yourself. You re-examine yourself. You examine yourself. And to know whether you have what it takes to walk somebody down the aisle and be joined together as husband and wife. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I taught as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. So if in your mind, you are contemplating on marriage, in your mind... You want to take a step into it and make a marriage proposal to some beautiful lady somewhere. Or some beautiful lady somewhere you are about to say yes to a marriage proposal from that handsome young man. Ask yourself, am I matured enough for that institution? You know why? Because the happiest relationships are built on a foundation of two Happy and healthy people who are ready to take on the challenges of a new life together. And that comes with a high level of understanding of the institution. It comes with a high level of maturity. Those who are ready to be in a long-term relationship have dealt with their own personal challenges and issues. And are not looking for someone to make them happy or to fix them in some way or vice versa. No. These are people who understand the issues. They, they, they have what it takes. They know what's up when it comes to marriage. How often have I asked would-be couples how many books you have read? And some say, Pastor, I have read none. But sometimes the question comes as a shock to them. And sometimes I feel some of them feeling so bad. And I want to go around it and tell them, well, but you may have listened to a marriage seminar before. <laughs> yeah, 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 Pastor, that's true, that's true. But the point is that, do you realize in yourself that I am ready for it? I am matured. You see, marriage is for, 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 for strong-minded persons, business business-minded persons. Because I am saying that marriage is a serious business. It's a serious enterprise. If you're not ready, don't go waste your time. Or don't go waste the time of some precious young man or some precious woman somewhere. So in making, re-examining yourself and asking yourself whether truly you are ready for this, you are probably talking about four things here. One, spiritual preparation. Have you done that? And when we talk about spiritual preparation, the first that I want to hit on is that are you ready or is she ready or is he ready to present this family to God when he appears the second time? For me, that is the first and foremost focus. When it comes to spiritual preparation, spiritually, will he be able to father my children and be a good mother to my children? Spiritually, 
would he be able to even hold devotions and, 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 and tilt my children towards the creator and the maker of this universe? These are important questions with, when it comes to uh, uh, assessing maturity. Spiritually, would he be able to, to take me and my children to church? And we'll not just be church people, but people who fear God. Not just people who walk sanctimoniously in church and be blessing people. God bless you, brother. God bless you, sister. No, far deeper and farther than that. Do we find in our home a spiritual master plan? Many churches, many, many churches even lack that. When I talk about spiritual master plan, I'm talking about a situation where somebody enters your home and right from your door, right up into your hall, there is something that is focusing, I mean, directing him to who you believe. I have heard some senior ministers who have driven in the night and have gotten to some point where they have had issues with their cars and they will have to sleep and spend the night somewhere. And they have done that out of fear. And I remember one, one senior minister telling me that, you see, when I entered the home and I saw a Sabbath school on the center table, it brought relief to my soul. And I slept that night like a baby. That is the spiritual master plan I am talking about. Which many, many churches lack. You can walk from their entrance into the church and nothing directs you to who they believe. Unless somebody has taken the microphone to preach or to teach. The next preparation that is worth mentioning, which I do not do in order of preference, is physical preparation. What do you have this evening? I was listening to an interview, because it's a public thing, I can say it here. You know, I was listening to an interview on, on one of the TV channels uh, with this guy called Ajiman and um, the good old Dinah Akumi. And she said that that gospel artist shares her experience, you know, when, when they got married so early. The husband was 23 years and, and, she, and she was 21 years. And when they got married, you know, they were very strict people. So she said that she will not enter the house of the man. So she never knew that the man didn't even have anything, including a bed in his room. When they got married, they stayed on their honeymoon for four, four days. And when they have to vacate the place, because they, they could pay for only four days, the husband told her, we don't have anywhere to go. It was just an individual who showed them kindness and took them to their home for some time. And the rest is history. My point is that there must be some physical preparation. You see, somebody who, who is, is, is that minded uh, you know, of entering into this very important institution is someone who would invest and who will acquire for themselves? I'm not talking about the fact that you must own a luxurious home or have an eight-bedroom apartment with a lawn and eight uh, or fleet of cars. No, far, far from that. I am talking about the fact that at least you would have left your mother and your father. I will counsel against on any day why you must marry and still stay in the homes of your parents. We can leave that for another day. So there must be some physical preparation. Acquire some basic things. I remember when I had just, I had just uh, finished a seminary and I, I have to leave my father and my mother. And I entered, they showed me to the mission house. At least I had my bed, I had my TV, you know, I have those ones. But I didn't have any stuff in chair. Luckily for me, when I entered the mission house, the district had a lot of plastic chairs. And so I also tried arranging my own. You know, usually you have two here, three here, and one one here. So I did the same arrangement. 
And when the, when, the, when the young folks will come, and you know, I love to be with young folks. They are always around me, and I cherish those moments. They will come and say, uh, Pastor, no, you have to buy some, some chairs, and you have to buy this. I say, sit on this for some time. Because, you see, I would give 50 CDs to one elder, and, and, I, and, and I, I, I appreciate him for that, Elder Moses. I, in Takwa, you know, I would give him 50 CDs. When I get 10 CDs, I'll give to him. An elder will be doing it. Sometimes he will buy with his own money. One day when they came in the morning, there it was. Some stuff in chairs. But that time Eva had not moved in. How can Eva moved in when I don't even have a place for that beautiful woman to sit? No, it will not happen. So there is some level of physical preparation that you must do. There is another preparation you must do talking about maturity Emotional preparation. Are you ready to carry a baby for nine months? Are you ready to go through that, that, that difficulty and challenging times? Are you ready to be able to go on, 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 that, on, that, on that table or on that bed and deliver a baby? Are you ready for it? When we talk about emotional preparation, when, when things are getting tough, are you always going to call your dad and call your mom and be crying on the other side of the phone every day? Is that what it is? When we talk about emotional preparation, I'm talking about when stressful and distressful times are hitting your marriage. Are you ready to be able to wrap your heads around them? Emotionally, you must be matured. Emotionally, you must be stable. If you cannot, then you would have to tune your mind to that. For every person who is preparing for marriage. The last bit I say tonight is financial preparation. And I want to encourage the young, the young men out there. There is, one, there is one thing you must begin to do now. Even as you watch me around the world and on, on some campuses, some of you that are watching, start cultivating the, the habit of investing so that when they give you your upkeep money to go to school and somebody dashed out money to you, make it a, a habit and a part of you to, to take some percentage of that money and put it somewhere for future use. Because I have, I have heard and I have seen quite a number of ladies who will get up one day and will call their boyfriends and will be telling them that, you see, dad is pressurizing me. There is this one that is... They are all telling me about marriage. And the lady knows that you don't even have a chair in your hall. And so it's as good as telling you that well, probably it might be over because there's somebody who is ready. And so you are, you are dating someone on campus now or you are dating a young, young person, young people are dating or they are courting or they are contemplating on marriage. But you see, all you know to do is to buy them all the chocolates. It's not bad. Buy them all the, 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 all, all the, all the food around the, the most popular joints in your neighborhood, they are not bad. But I am saying that you must cultivate the habit of setting some money aside. Because one day, you want to make a step into this noble institution. And so maturity is something you must really assess yourself on. Number two, know and have conflict resolution skills. You want to enter into marriage, but you don't have any idea or any requisite skill to aid you in resolving conflict in marriage. As and when they come. Talking about conflict, let me say this. Growing up, we have come to know this very statement that we disagree to agree. But for me, with my understanding, it is the other way around. 
you must agree to disagree. Because you see, you must agree to discuss on an issue. For example, by the grace of God, you may have been able to come to a point where you say that 13th of March is our wedding day. And now you want to talk about the kind of gown the, the woman will have to wear or the kind of suit the man will have to wear. You see, you must be able to come to a point where we'll say that we have tabled this. Let's discuss it. If you cannot even discuss it, how do you even build a consensus? And so my point really is that agree to discuss. And for folks who are watching that are married, I can also share with you that probably you have put up a building and you, and you, and you want to paint the building at the end of the day. You must agree to say that what kind of paint we must, we, would we have to use? And now you are able to judge or and say that we want, to paint, we want to paint it white or we want to do a green painting. But if you cannot agree to discuss that, how would you build consensus? And for me, that is very paramount. So you must know conflict resolution skills or when something crops up, in, in, even prior to your marriage, and for three months, three months, you don't talk to each other. You don't call each other. You don't text, you don't text each other. You don't send a WhatsApp message. You are not ready for marriage. And I must tell you, and I must be frank with you, you are not ready for it. There is an issue. And I'm saying that when you go into marriage, this is not to scare you, but that is the reality. That at certain times, because you have different backgrounds. It gets to a point where things may not be as you have as your background. It may erupt, but it is not for you to break off. It is for you to know what to do. And, and it is basically because of how different backgrounds we have. And because of that, conflict will be inevitable, even in the happiest of marriage relationships. And so all relationships, or all people in relationships must be able to have some of these things at their, at their fingertips. When handled in a positive manner, overcoming the conflict can strengthen the relationship. And that is also key. Begin by setting the ground rules, such as choosing when and where to deal with the conflict and remembering to practice good listening and good communicating skills. If would be couples cannot listen. You see, I don't have time to share with you listening and listening techniques. They are so paramount in every relationship, including relationships that are leading to marriage. And that is true. You see, you must have a good listening ear. There are a lot of us, we don't listen. And when we listen, we don't, we don't attend. You must be able to give to the, other, to the other your undivided attention. And when it is your time to speak about whatever issue is on table to discuss, you must be mindful the words you use. Oh, how I wish... I mean, friends who are, are courting and are dating and are, are contemplating on, on marriage will learn to use healthy words. Healthy words. Let your speeches be... And Paul says it like, let your speech be graced with salt. That you may know how to answer each one another. Friends, If you are contemplating on marriage, you must be as well be, be reading and training and attending seminars that will help you have the requisite conflict resolution skills. If you cannot, it is time for you to learn. There are people who are mastering in this area where you can when you can where you can attend to their seminars or read their books, or go to them when they are available and have discussion on that. So we have two or three more to go. 
The next thing, I've told you that there are so many that are bundled out there. But putting them together, I am saying that one another thing that you must, must have on your fingertips before you can say yes to anybody or, or, or you can say you are preparing to enter, enter this holy institution is to know the family of your spouse to be. Know them. Don't stay away. Don't think it is not necessary. It is very necessary. In fact, I am even pushing the argument further to say that if you have a guy, if you have a lady, and you guys are contemplating on marriage, and at any point in time, I am saying that, any point in time, you happen to have met his friends or her friends, and they cannot introduce you to them. It's a red flag. Or if you have a lady, or if you have a guy, and you some, you know, some people even request, and you request to meet their family, or she requests to meet, and they are not ready to take you to their families. It's a red flag. It's a red flag. It's a red flag for you to know that there is some particular interest or benefit probably the individual is having with you. And they are not really talking about marriage. Much of who we, we are was learned from growing up in our family. So we can learn a lot about what someone would be like as a partner and parent from observing, asking questions, and spending time with their family. And that is critical. Pay them a visit. And when you visit, ask some questions. And when you visit, observe. Observe how they treat their, their, their sisters, their elderly and, 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 and the kid sisters. Uh, observe how she, she, treats, she treats her her elderly brothers and, 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 and kid brothers. Observe them. Observe how he treats or she treats the parent. Observe them. You see, they are, they are speaking volumes of the partner you are just about entering into that long-term lasting relationship with. If there are concerns about a partner's family or a negative trait a partner has learned from his or her family, you may want to think twice before getting too serious with that relationship. While change is possible, my friend, it takes time and effort, and it is much easier to change before getting into a serious relationship. Because, see, when you have to work with, uh, with a clay, you can make the clay into whatsoever shape you want, as long as it is still wet. But when the, when, the, when the clay becomes dried up, if you try to make it to, to un, any other shape, it gets broken. And that is how exactly relationships are. And so if there is anything you can do, do it before you get locked up in that relationship. Because if you, if you, if you think they are nothing and you wait until you have gone into it and you want to change things, my friend, that will be more difficult for you. And you see, and that is why I agree with a lot of information that has to do with premarital sex. So when there is so much premarital sex in, in that kind of relationship, especially, especially, you realize that in most of this relationship, our, our women are most often than not at the receiving end. And why a woman will find it extremely, extremely difficult to leave that relationship is because their nakedness have been seen. Or a woman usually will feel very used. Because I am yet to hear a man who will come to me and say, Pastor, that girl has used me. Or that, that, that woman has used me. Often than not, we hear women saying that they feel used by the opposite sex. And you see, if you have shown your nakedness, and this gentleman has been taking it like 
He's taking multivite, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, one in the evening. And when they are going to bed, they take one before they sleep. It will be extremely difficult for you to accept that these observations that I am making in their homes are things probably that will endanger our marital relationship. But you keep quiet and you're like, when? well, let's let him put the wedding ring on my, or the wedding band on my hand, on my finger. And when I have gone into his home, I will try changing it or I will let him know how I would want to have it happen. And so remember my example with the clay. When it is worked, you can turn it up and down into any form and shape. But when that clay is dried up and you try, it gets broken. I know which number we have, but it could be number four. Know about personality compatibility. It is so important. Now there are there are there are there are graded theories, but yeah, I still want to mention uh, because the marriage counseling thing, the typical marriage counseling setting. I want to go with the traditional ones that we know, the traditional temperaments that we know. But you see. While we probably won't have everything in common with our partner, happy relationships often have many of these traits in common. They have they 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 they, they, they talk and think about emotional temperament and people who have sense of humor. Sometimes you find some other partners in some relationship so serious. Ah, you have worked with this lady, especially you have worked with this man for two years. There have never been a time they have shared with you any humor. Abba. If you want, if you want to revitalize and, and, and revive and lubricate and maintain your marriage or your relationship leading to marriage, you must have a sense of humor. Some of us, we have tried to learn to have sense of humor. So some of us, wherever we are, we get people to laugh. Some of us, we are too serious. We take life too serious. Take it easy, my friend. Take it easy and move on. There must be that, that level of intelligence. Don't get hooked up to dumb, dumb people. No. That is something you must... Check the energy level. See whether you have rec uh, recreation um, the, the interest. Like you people have common interest even when it comes to recreation. And check how people would, will express their affection. Very important. Once a while. Why not, why not express love in some other way? I mean, if you cannot do anything, uh, my guy, if you're coming from town, my lady, you're coming from town, and just just buy a small box and buy just some some one CD worth of Kiliwili. You know, those of you who do not know Kiliwili, it's um, it's cut pieces of ripe plantain. You know, that is um, how do how would the woman how would the woman say it? But they they have add spices and things like that to it and they have fried it. It is so sweet. You know, just one CD worth of it, drop, cover it nicely, drop it in the box and wrap it and put put ribbons around it. And when you get home, when you, when you get to the table where you are having your 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 date or dinner or something, when you when the lady is sitting beautifully there and waiting for you and when you walk there, you to the to the amazement of everybody in that in that dining and and in that hall, and you go like pam 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 na 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 na, and you place it before them, and you know, ladies, they are like that. They they want to open the thing, but they are doing themselves like you know. And finally, she gets to open it, and she opened she I mean she opened the box, and 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 this sits in full of oil around it. And uh, you know, Kelly Willie has very serious scent or, or smell. You will know it. You will know it that it is Kelly Willie. And there it is. How lovely. 
and romantic that will be. But know, know who a sanguine is. Know who a melancholic is. Know who a phlegmatic is. And know who a choleric is. Know it. Sometimes people come for marriage counseling and you ask them temperament. And they don't understand. They don't even know anything about it. And sometimes some of them will have to go and read about it. And it's a whole two, three session exercise only on temperament. That's one way you can prepare. My friend, beware of each other's value. And tonight, I just want to talk about one sensitive one. Make religious considerations a priority. As, as much as you can, just like the Bible discourages and encourages. I want to encourage you that marry somebody you share the same faith with. Don't play with that. Because First Corinthians, Second Corinthians 6.14 addresses that. Don't be equally yoked with unbelievers. Think about it. Think deep about it before you start giving me examples. That is very serious. Know your responsibilities as a spouse to be to the other partner. You don't know, you don't know what, are, what the needs of men are. You don't know what the needs of women are. You don't know your responsibility as a woman. You, or you have not even come to terms with the responsibilities of a woman in a marital home. I have said two things. You don't know. And you have not come to terms with. You have not come to terms with will mean that you know, but you don't believe it. And you keep, you keep telling yourself, I'm a career woman. I am this, I am too. And when they give you pack food at, at the office, that is what you bring home for your husband to eat. Or that is what you provide for your wife and children to eat. No. You cannot replace that on any day with anything. Practice the principle of synergy, which says that one plus one is not two, but one plus one is three. This is a term widely used in the business uh, arena, but it is very much applicable when it comes to, you know, relationship and, and, and especially relationship that is leading to marriage. That is where you, you, as a woman, you must understand that you have some responsibility, you have some commitment, some efforts to put in. And that must be deliberate and that must be intentional. Before, you, before some of us got married, you could walk out at, the, at your door at any time and travel at any time. You understand? But this time around, when you're going and you have not even mentioned anything to them and they ask you, where are you going? You have every right to answer. You must answer where you are going. You must tell us when you are coming and, and all of that. Read good books on marriage and know things like that. I end with this quote from Socrates. And he says this, by all means, marry. If you get a good wife, you will become happy. If you get a bad one, you will become a philosopher. And I agree, I agree with him in total. That friends, the Bible says that he who finds a wife finds favor with the Lord. So it will take grace for you to find your ideal woman and for you to find your ideal man. Don't forget, and I want to tell you again, that as you contemplate, Socrates is saying that, by all means, marry. If you get a good wife, you become happy. If you get a bad one, you will become a philosopher. May God bless you. And may God help you as you contemplate and make plans to get hooked up to that lucky man or that lucky woman. God bless you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let me pray with you. So, Father, we thank you for what you have brought to our table this evening. 
We thank you for the love. We thank you for the care. And we thank you for the intentions that you have towards us. I want to commit every young person that I have watched tonight into your hands that are making plans to go into this beautiful institution that you, O oh Lord, will lead them aright. For those of us who are already in it, we ask that you, O oh Lord, will continue to revive our marriage on any day. Bless us and give us the strength and make, uh, make time to be with you throughout the entire week. And when we have been blessed at the end of the day, we'll have the cause to give you all the praises and adoration that you deserve. We thank you because you're still God. We thank you because you're still a prayer answering God. You have answered our prayer this evening. For we have prayed in your son Jesus' name. Amen. We want to say thank you for making time to join us tonight. May God richly bless you for those of you who were able to be here and those who joined us online. We want to make a special appeal. Please, we want to hear from you. So as you watch, send us your feedback, your comments. That will enable us to improve on what we are doing. Tomorrow, we will continue. And tomorrow's topic is making the choice of a lifetime. The Secret of the Right Choice of a Life Partner. We start at 6.30 in the evening and we'll close by 8 p.m. We want to plead with our online audience. There is a form that we've posted. Please kindly attempt to fill them for us. Let us all bow as we receive the benediction and leave. And now, Father, grant us a restful night. Make this week a productive week as we commence work tomorrow. We ask that tomorrow you bring us back safely to continue on this service. And now to you who is able to keep us from falling, to present us faultless before the throne of grace, to the only wise God be all the glory and the honor and the adoration. Let God's people say amen. God bless you. We'll see you, God willing, tomorrow. Have a restful night. <laughs>